Now, I will be talking about diffuse lung diseases and at the same time important high-resolution CT findings. I'll talk about the most important diseases you might see, uh, the common diseases in clinical practice, and the most important CT findings in identifying those diseases. Now, this is a radiograph of a lung slice of two pulmonary lobules, and I'm going to br begin by briefly reviewing anatomy of the secondary lobule because many abnormalities we identify on high-resolution CT are based on abnormalities of the secondary lobule. Now, what we see here are two pulmonary lobules. They are marginated by connective tissue interlobular septa that contain pulmonary vein and lymphatic branches. In the center of the pulmonary lobule is the branching centrolobular artery that is normally visible on high resolution CT. And then adjacent to that is the centrolobular bronchiole, which is not normally visible on high resolution CT. Now, the first finding I want to talk about, the first abnormal finding you should look for, is interlobular septal thickening. Interlobular septal thickening rep, uh, results in a reticular abnormality that you recognize, and you can tell that the lines you see represent thickened interlobular septa because the lines outline what you can recognize as secondary pulmonary lobules because of their characteristic size and shape. Here, a very nice secondary pulmonary lobule in the lung periphery. It's marginated by interlobular septa. It's about two centimeters in diameter. In the center of it is the centrolobular artery that you can normally see. And on occasion, you can see pulmonary vein branches within the interlobular septa appearing as a dot. This happens to be a patient with interstitial pulmonary edema. As you know, interstitial edema is a cause or common cause of interlobular septal thickening. Now, as far as the significance of this finding on high-resolution CT, ignore it. Ignore interlobular septal thickening unless it is the predominant finding that you see. Almost everyone is going to show a little interlobular septal thickening if they have an abnormal scan. It's of no value in diagnosis. Don't think about it. Don't dictate it. Don't do anything with it unless it's the predominant finding. If it is the predominant finding, the common causes are interstitial pulmonary edema, lymphangitic spread of neoplasm, other causes of interstitial infiltration, and there are a few, but the two top diagnoses I mentioned are listed on the slide. And occasionally, patients with fibrosis will show interlobular septal thickening as a manifestation of their disease. Now, this is a nice example of curly B lines as shown on a chest radiograph. And of course, curly B lines are the plain film equivalent of interlobular septal thickening seen on high resolution CT. Now, here is a patient who shows smooth interlobular septal thickening. It is predominantly unilateral. Here we can see a nice pulmonary lobule in the lung periphery with thickened septa outlining its margins. Another level in the same patient, interlobular septal thickening that is unilateral in distribution. There's also a right pleural effusion present. When you see a symmetrical interlobular septal thickening such as this, you should think of, think of lymphangitic spread of carcinoma. This disease, of course, may be bilateral as well, but uh, a unilateral appearance like this would be quite unusual with pulmonary edema. And this is a lung slice in a different patient who has lymphangitic spread of carcinoma, but you can see thickening of the interlobular septa as a result of uh, interstitial spread of this tumor. Now, the second finding I will discuss is honeycombing. And this is a very nice example of what honeycombing looks like on high-resolution CT. We see these cystic areas of lung destruction in a subpleural location. You must see these black holes in a subpleural location to call it honeycombing. And this is a patient who has the most common cause of honeycombing, and we will discuss this, usual interstitial pneumonia, or UIP, with the associated disease being idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF. Now, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. These are important to know about. These are reactions to lung injury. They are not diseases, but they are reactions to lung injury. They occur in several, several patterns with variable inflammation and fibrosis. They have a variable response to treatment, and they have a variety of causes. These may be idiopathic. They may be associated with collagen vascular disease as a common cause. They may be associated with uh, drug treatment, 
or due to inhalation. So these are not diseases but reactions to lung injury. Now the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias are classified as shown on this slide. There are six of them that are currently recognized as being uh, typical of this sort of disease or this abnormality. And the four that I'm listing at the top and are shown in white we will discuss and these are the most common ones seen in clinical practice. UIP or usual interstitial pneumonia, NSIP or nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, OP or organizing pneumonia, also known as BOOP. And then DIP, disclaimant of interstitial pneumonia, representing basically the same abnormality as respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease. Now the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society got together in 2001 and tried to bring some sense to this classification of interstitial pneumonias. And what they did was make a distinction between the histologic pattern of the interstitial pneumonia and the idiopathic clinical syndrome associated with it. So the histologic pattern is what the pathologist will diagnose. The idiopathic clinical syndrome is the disease the patient has. The histologic pattern of UIP or usual interstitial pneumonia is associated with the idiopathic clinical syndrome of IPF. Nonspecific interstitial pneumonia on histology is associated with idiopathic NSIP as the clinical syndrome. Organizing pneumonia, the histologic pattern, is associated with the disease known as cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, or COP, or idiopathic BOOP. You can call it either one. And DIP, the histologic pattern, is associated with the idiopathic clinical syndrome, DIP. Now what they don't emphasize in this classification and what is very important for you to know is that these exact same histologic patterns are associated with diseases, known diseases that the patient may have. It may not be an idiopathic clinical syndrome. UIP may be seen with collagen diseases, drug reactions, asbestosis. NSIP, common in collagen vascular disease, very common or as a drug reaction. Organizing pneumonia may be related to infection, collagen vascular disease, drugs, fume inhalation, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, DIP, smoking, or fumes. It is uncommonly an idiopathic disease. Now let's talk first about usual interstitial pneumonia, or UIP. This is very common, and that's why it's called usual interstitial pneumonia. It's the one that is usually present. Histology shows heterogeneous fibrosis. The key word here is heterogeneous. The biopsy looks heterogeneous. On CT, what we typically see is reticulation, traction bronchiectasis, and I will show you what those look like, honeycombing in 70% of cases. Ground glass opacity is very uncommon as an isolated finding. You may see it in association with the reticulation or honeycombing or whatever, but you don't see it by itself. The distribution is typical basal, posterior, and lower lobe. Idiopathic UIP is the disease, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which has a very poor prognosis. But that same histologic pattern UIP may be seen with collagen diseases, asbestosis, drug fibrosis, and stage hypersensitivity. Now this a sagittal lung slice in a patient who has UIP and IPF and shows very nicely the typical posterior subpleural location of honeycombing that's seen in this disease with the posterior costophrenic angle being most severely involved. Here the cross-sectional appearance of honeycombing. We see cystic lucencies. These are areas of lung destruction. Uh, these contain air and therefore we see them as black holes on CT. Three to 10 millimeters in diameter in most cases but may be larger or smaller. They must be subpleural. If you see a black hole that is not immediately beneath the pleural surface, you cannot call it honeycombing with certainty. Early on, you will only see one or two isolated subpleural cysts. <clears throat> Later on, you will see multiple layers of cysts beneath the pleural surface. And when the cysts are numerous, they share walls, as we see in this example. Now, this is what UIP IPF looks like on a chest radiograph, one of the most important findings is that the lung volumes are reduced. The lungs are small in size because of fibrosis and lung restriction. You may be able to see some sort of reticular abnormality at the lung bases, and that would be the typical location of this disease. 
On a lateral view, what you will typically see is a reticular pattern in the posterior costophrenic angle. That is the earliest abnormality in this disease and the most typical. Now this is a high resolution CT, a very nice example of UIP-IPF. We see honeycombing in a subpleural location. These are black holes, areas of lung destruction immediately beneath the pleural surface. This person has uh, moderate to severe honeycombing, so we're seeing multiple layers here. The distribution is subpleural, posterior, and lower lobe predominant. <clears throat> now, if you see honeycombing on a high-resolution CT, the, uh, you have a differential diagnosis, and for the most part, the differential diagnosis is the differential diagnosis of UIP. And again, the common causes, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, and other collagen diseases, but rheumatoid and scleroderma are the most common ones. Drug-related fibrosis, chronic hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, asbestosis, which is an uncommon disease these days, end-stage sarcoid, which is a common disease but uncommonly results in honeycombing. Fibrotic, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia may result in a little bit of honeycombing, and I'll show you cases of that. Now again, the, the idiopathic disease that's associated with UIP is IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's the most common cause. If you have the disease idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, your histology must be UIP. That's the only thing that's allowed. Patients are generally older than 50. They have progressive dyspnea, dry cough, and so-called Velcro rowels, where you listen to the lung bases and it sounds like Velcro opening and closing. Mean survival is only three years. Five-year survival, 25 to 40 percent. Having IPF is like having lung cancer. Another example of UIP-IPF, we see a posterior subpleural distribution of reticulation and a little bit of honeycombing in the immediate subpleural lung, a nice example of what a sort of moderate case of IPF would look like. This is an example of UIP-IPF where there's a little bit of honeycombing in the posterior subpleural lung, a little bit on the other side as well, but the predominant abnormality here is reticulation and traction bronchiectasis. And traction bronchiectasis means that these airways are dilated in this very odd sort of corkscrewed fashion because of surrounding lung fibrosis that pulls on the bronchial walls and makes them dilate. If you see traction bronchiectasis like this in a patient with reticulation, you know you are looking at lung fibrosis. There's the traction bronchiectasis, and here is a lung slice this is a patient with UIP-IPF. You can see honeycombing in the subpleural lung, but more centrally, this dilated, irregular, corkscrewed bronchus, and that represents traction bronchiectasis, a finding indicative of lung fibrosis. Now, if you happen to see a patient with UIP-IPF in an early stage, all you will see is a little bit of irregular reticulation in the posterior uh, subpleural lung bases. This is what an early case looks like. It's quite nonspecific at this stage and you would not be able to make the diagnosis. Now overall, as far as the diagnosis of IPF using high resolution CT, basal honeycombing visible on high res has a high predictive value for UIP. In the absence of a known disease, such as collagen disease, or exposure, to drugs, asbestos, organic antigens, IPF is very likely going to be the diagnosis if you see honeycombing. IPF has a poor prognosis, treatment of little value, lung biopsy very unlikely to be performed if IPF is suspected. So keep in mind that if you call honeycombing and you think it's IPF, they're not usually going to do a lung biopsy to con confirm the diagnosis. So here we go, this is a 55-year-old patient, no diseases, no drugs, no exposures. We see honeycombing in the subpleural lung, a very nice example. This is going to be UIP-IPF. Now here we have a 35-year-old patient, young for IPF, who has shortness of breath and rheumatoid arthritis. If he has rheumatoid arthritis, by definition this cannot be IPF. He has a disease that's associated with honeycombing. This is rheumatoid lung disease. It looks exactly the same, same appearance. Here we see a patient with peripheral and basal honeycombing, a nice example of honeycombing in the subpleural lung. On a tissue window scan, notice that we're seeing calcified pleural plaques. This is asbestosis. <clears throat> 
On the lung window scans, it looks exactly like IPF, but the calcified pleural plaques give it away for what it is. Now this is a graph that shows survival, or non-survival, I should say, of patients who have idiopathic UIP or IPF. The survival curve drops off very steeply over a period of years, but not all UIP is the same. This is the survival curve of UIP in collagen disease. No one is dying from that abnormality. So even though the histology is the same, the abnormality or the disease does not result in the same survival. Okay, the next interstitial pneumonia is nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. This is less common than UIP, and this is a specific entity despite the name. At the AFIP, they suggest that this is not a real thing. This is absolutely a real thing. The histology is homogeneous inflammation or fibrosis, unlike UIP, which is heterogeneous in appearance. This disease occurs in cellular or inflammatory and fibrotic forms. It may be inflammatory or fibrotic, in other words. It's a very common pattern in collagen vascular disease, also drug reactions, and sometimes idiopathic. It has a good response to treatment, five-year survival, 80 to 90 percent, a very different survival than UIP. Typical findings on high-resolution CT are a combination of ground glass opacities and reticular opacities. If you see ground glass opacity alone in a patient with this disease, it is cellular NSIP. If you see ground glass opacity plus reticulation, it may be cellular or fibrotic. If you see traction bronchiectasis in association with the abnormality, that means that fibrotic NSIP is likely. And if you see honeycombing, that means fibrotic NSIP. Now I should point out that as opposed to UIP, honeycombing is quite uncommon in this disease, one to five percent of patients, and when you see it, it is very minimal in extent. It has a lower lobe, posterior, and peripheral predominance, which is similar to UIP, but there's a very important finding in making the distinction, and that is sparing of the immediate subpleural lung that is seen in 20 to 50 percent of patients and is highly suggestive. It's mostly a slam dunk if you see that appearance on CT, and I'll show you what that looks like. So here are a 43-year-old woman with dyspnea for three months. <clears throat> to prone scans, we see uh, ground glass opacity, which is lower lobe and somewhat concentric in distribution, but notice that there is sparing, relative sparing of the immediate subpleural lung. That is something you don't see in UIP and you see commonly in NSIP, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. Another example, ground glass opacity with a little reticulation, sparing of the immediate subpleural lung. I think it's easy to see the lung immediately beneath the pleural surface is not as abnormal. Cellular NSIP. Now here a patient who shows reticulation, these lines instead of ground glass, and a little bit of traction bronchiectasis. And notice that the lung immediately beneath the pleural surface is less abnormal. The lung a centimeter or so away is more abnormal. This is fibrotic NSIP. Another example, reticulation and traction bronchiectasis, a great example of traction bronchiectasis with subpleural sparing, fibrotic NSIP. If you see that subpleural sparing, think of this disease. Now if you compare survival of <clears throat> patients with UIP, which drops off very quickly, to those with NSIP, you can see patients with NSIP do a lot better. And if you break down the patients with NSIP into cellular and fibrotic forms, fibrotic NSIP is somewhere in between cellular disease and UIP IPF. Now by this time, you should be able to make the distinction between these two cases. One is UIP and one is NSIP. I think everybody here will get these right. If you happen to see a case of this in a test that you may take in the future, this is what they will look like, UIP and NSIP. Okay, the next interstitial pneumonia I'll talk about is respiratory bronchiolitis and disquamate of interstitial pneumonia, or DIP. Almost all cases are related to smoking. This is a smoking-related disease. RB is respiratory bronchiolitis, and that's a common histologic abnormality in smokers. If a smoker has a lung biopsy, it's almost 100% that the lung biopsy will show this, regardless of why he's having it. 
If you have respiratory bronchiolitis histologically plus symptoms, if the patient's short of breath because of it, that's called respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease. DIP is the same histology but is more extensive in distribution. These are all three basically the same abnormality. They're different points, points on the spectrum of the same smoking-related disease. DIP is much less common than UIP or NSIP. It's treated with steroids and has a good prognosis. Now what we see histologically in this abnormality is intraalveolar macrophages. Macrophages fill the air spaces with very little fibrosis. Ground glass opacity is what we see on high resolution CT. In patients with respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease, the abnormality we see is localized and typically central lobular. Ground glass opacity is more diffuse in DIP and may be patchy or subpleural in distribution. So this is a 56-year-old smoker with respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease. What we see is, or what we see are patchy ground glass opacities with some accentuation in a central lobular uh, location. Notice that the disease involves the entire cross-section of lung, where NSIP is typically subpleural. And here a patient with more extensive abnormality. This represents DIP. Uh, with these areas of ground glass opacity. Again, this is much less common than the other interstitial pneumonias. Now I'll move on to a discussion of increased lung opacity as shown on high resolution CT, and this may either be consolidation where the increased lung opacity obscures underlying vessels, or it may be ground glass opacity where increased lung opacity does not obscure underlying vessels. Now, when I see a patient who shows consolidation on high-res CT as the principal abnormality, what I want to know is whether the symptoms are acute or chronic. The team comes down to go over the case. I see consolidation. I ask them a lot of, quest ask them a lot of questions about the case. Is the patient short of breath? What are the pulmonary function tests? What are the lab values? They think I'm really smart because I'm asking about all these things and know about them, but in fact, I don't. And all I'm listening for is whether the symptoms are acute or chronic. And it takes about 10 minutes to find out, but <laughs> I will find out, and my reputation has uh, improved because of it. Anyway, you see consolidation with acute symptomatology. Think of pneumonia, pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage, or diffuse alveolar damage, which is the histology of ARDS. If you see consolidation in a patient with chronic symptomatology, the differential diagnosis, organizing pneumonia, or BOOP, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, bronchioloalveolar carcinoma. Those are important diseases to think of. So here's a patient with lupus uh, and acute dyspnea. The high-resolution CT shows patchy consolidation, so we're seeing uh, consolidation with acute symptomatology, pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage, pneumonia, ARDS, pulmonary hemorrhage. Here we have a 73-year-old patient who has been treated for pneumonia and despite treatment remains febrile and has been febrile for six weeks. So these are chronic symptoms associated with patchy areas of consolidation, some peripheral, some central and peribronchial. This is a great appearance for organizing pneumonia. Boop, patchy areas of consolidation involving peripheral and peribronchial lung. Now organizing pneumonia is the histologic pattern is a histologic pattern and it's characterized by granulation tissue polyps and bronchioles and patchy organizing pneumonia. Because of that combination, it was formerly called bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia, but now the organizing pneumonia is what is emphasized and that is the name that's currently used. This histology, organizing pneumonia, is associated with the syndrome known in the U.S. as BOOP, the ATS, American Thoracic Society, e, or European Respiratory Society prefers organizing pneumonia, or COP, as the designations for this uh, disease, but we tend to say BOOP in the United States because it's just so much fun to say. Common disease, idiopathic infections, drugs, collagen diseases, fumes, a lot of different causes. Typical history is several months of cough, dyspnea, low-grade fever. It responds well to steroids, has a good prognosis, and five-year survival is nearly 100%. Now as far as high resolution CT, what we see is patchy airspace consolidation or ground glass. That is the usual thing. Large nodules or masses in 15%. The typical distribution is peripheral and peribronchial. The opacity is often irregular in shape. Findings of fibrosis generally are absent. And there's another finding you may see called the 
atoll sign or reversed halo sign that's very characteristic of this disease. Now here's a patient with organizing pneumonia, a patient who has been uh, treated with amiodarone. We see these irregular areas of consolidation that are subpleural and peribronchial, very irregular in shape, a typical appearance of organizing pneumonia. Notice that this one opacity here in the right lung has a little ground glass opacity in the middle. That is the, uh, halo, uh, the uh, atoll sign or reversed halo sign. And this is another example, patient with organizing pneumonia or BOOP. This is what the halo sign is. You've probably heard of this, a dense central nodule surrounded by a ground glass opacity halo, typical of angioinvasive aspergillosis, but with a large differential diagnosis. This is the exact opposite of that. This is an atoll. An atoll is a ring-shaped coral reef enclosing a lagoon and surrounded by the open sea. Only about half of our residents here at UC know what an atoll is, which is why I show this picture. Evidently, they don't spend as much time in Hawaii as does the faculty. But you can see this appearance exactly the same. Notice there may be breaks in the atoll for the tide to go in and out, and you often see breaks in the ring in the atoll sign with ground glass opacity in the center. Very, very typical of organizing pneumonia or boop. Really a slam dunk sort of ant mini diagnosis. And these are pictures from the literature of the same thing in the literature. Uh, after the word atoll sign was used, it was called the reversed halo sign because it's the opposite of the halo sign, but you can see these nice atolls here occurring in patients who have boop or organizing pneumonia. Now, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia is an abnormality that is idiopathic or associated with exposure to a known antigen. It's an allergic response. Peripheral eosinophilia is usually associated with it. History is months of fever, cough, dyspnea, and weight loss. Asthma is a common association. It's identical to BOOP in CT appearances and symptoms, and in fact, may be the same disease. So if you think about BOOP, think about this as well. If you think about eosinophilic pneumonia, think about BOOP. They may be exactly the same disease. We see peripheral ground glass opacity or consolidation on high-res CT. Upper lobe predominance is common has a rapid response to steroids, and in fact, you may see the atoll sign or reversed halo sign in this entity as well. A patient here with two months of cough and dyspnea, these sort of patchy peripheral consolidations on a chest film, reasonably typical of chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. On CT, you see these patchy areas of consolidation that are peribronchial and peripheral, just like you would see in BOOP. And two more levels in the same patient, these patchy areas of consolidation, and notice that some are showing a reversed uh, halo sign or atoll sign with a little bit of ground glass opacity. Peripheral eosinophilia was present in this patient, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Now the third thing I want you to remember when you see consolidation associated with chronic symptoms is bronchioloalveolar carcinoma, which may result in chronic consolidation or ground glass. And this is the histology that's typically associated with this occurrence. The tumor, the bronchioloalveolar cell carcinoma, grows along alveolar walls using alveolar walls as a scaffold. That is called lipidic growth. And the tumor cells secrete uh, mucin and a serous fluid, and that fluid and mucin fills the alveoli. And it is that which causes consolidation, not the tumor. But nonetheless, BAC is in the differential diagnosis. Now here's a patient who shows ground glass opacity. Ground glass opacity means the lung is abnormally dense, but you can still see vessels, you can still see anatomy in the abnormal lung regions, and you may or may not see air bronchograms. This is good pasture syndrome with pulmonary hemorrhage. Now this is a uh, histo histologic appearance of normal alveoli. What you see or what causes ground glass opacity is either thickening of the alveolar walls or partial alveolar filling or decreased alveolar air, in other words, atelectasis. And these are examples that I created using Photoshop. Here I have thickened the alveolar walls. That would result in ground glass opacity. Here there is filling or partial filling of the air spaces. That would result in ground glass opacity. And here if you decrease the volume of that tissue, you will see ground glass opacity. So it is a nonspecific finding that may be seen with different histologies.
Now, I approach ground glass opacity in exactly the same way I approach consolidation. I want to know if the symptoms are acute or chronic, and that will determine my differential. Ground glass with acute symptoms, pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage, and a typical pneumonia, such as pneumocystis or a viral pneumonia, and then again, diffuse alveolar damage. This differential diagnosis is basically the same as consolidation with acute symptoms. So here a patient with parahylar ground glass opacity shown on high-res CT with acute dysthmia. This is diffuse alveolar damage due to cocaine. Now if you have ground glass opacity associated with chronic symptomatology, the differential diagnosis is longer and it includes the interstitial pneumonias that I talked about, NSIP and DIP, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is a very common disease, organizing pneumonia can do it, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia can do it, BAC can do it, lipoid pneumonia, a rare cause, and alveolar proteinosis, also a rare cause. Now here a patient with three months of progressive dyspnea. The high-res CT shows a patchy appearance of ground glass opacity. The lungs are abnormally dense. This is a patient with hypersensitivity pneumonitis and a very common appearance for that disease. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis, common in clinical practice, it's caused by inhalation of organic antigens. The responsible antigen, however, I should emphasize, is identified in only half of cases, even if you look very hard, so you may not know what the exposure is. It occurs in acute, subacute, and chronic stages. Repeated exposure causes fever, chills, dry cough, and dyspnea. Their symptoms are progressive over months or years and chest radiographs quite nonspecific. Now we usually image patients when they are in the subacute stage of hypersensitivity pneumonitis and what we see is patchy ground glass opacity is the most frequent finding, ill-defined central lobular nodules of ground glass opacity, mosaic perfusion, patchy lucencies that are due to airways disease and air trapping and if you do expiratory scans you will see air trapping in many patients with this disease. It tends to be diffuse or predominant in the mid-lung zones and involves the entire cross-section of lung. There is no subpleural predominance in this disease like you see with some of the interstitial pneumonias. So here again, a patient with dyspnea for months, a very nice example of patchy areas of ground glass opacity. These are somewhat geographic in appearance. They're involving the entire cross-section of lung. There is no subpleural predominance, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. 66-year-old bird fancier with progressive dyspnea, patchy ground glass opacity, and then also these focal lucencies. These are individual pulmonary lobules that are trapping air and therefore uh, show mosaic perfusion or lucency on the inspiratory scan. And if you look at an expiratory scan in this patient, you can see air trapping in those areas of mosaic perfusion because of bronchiolar obstruction. Now in patients who have chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis or hypersensitivity pneumonitis that has led to fibrosis, what you will typically see is reticulation and traction bronchiectasis with that same cross-sectional patchy distribution. This is sort of like the same distribution you would see with subacute HP, but here we're seeing findings of fibrosis with reticulation, traction bronchiectasis, distortion of the fissures, distortion of lung uh, anatomy. Now one last typ typical appearance in ground glass opacity is in this patient with six months of progressive dyspnea. And what we see is a finding called crazy paving where there is interlobular septal thickening in association with the ground glass. You see it in the same areas. And that, <clears throat> that is a finding that is nonspecific but very typical of alveolar proteinosis and this a biopsy in alveolar proteinosis and the ground glass is due to filling of the alveoli by this lipoproteinaceous material. And then the interlobular septal thickening is because the septa or lymphatics in the septa are filled with the same material. Now I'm going to move to a discussion of nodular lung disease on high resolution CT. Lung disease characterized primarily by the presence of multiple nodules. And most important in differential diagnosis of multinodular disease is the specific anatomic distribution of the nodules that you see. And there are three that we can identify on high res based on their specific pattern. And these are perilymphatic, uh, 
random, and centrolobular. And these can be distinguished with a high degree of accuracy, and that leads to a relatively short differential. Now, this is a nice uh, diagram or picture of what perilymphatic nodules are. I drew it myself, so it's particularly nice. The nodules in this disease, or in this pattern, occur in relation to lymphatics in the lung. And because lymphatics occur in specific regions, we see specific abnormalities with a perilymphatic pattern. What we see are nodules in relation to the pleural surfaces, and these may be the fissures or the peripheral pleural surfaces. We see nodules in relation to central bronchi and vessels, in other words, peri uh, peribronchovascular nodules and sometimes you see nodules in relation to interlobular septa. And three, these three specific locations are characteristic of a perilymphatic pattern. And because the nodules are involving these specific regions, the overall appearance you see is patchy. Some lung regions look very abnormal. Some lung regions look much less abnormal. Now, differential diagnosis of a perilymphatic distribution. In 90, 95% of cases, it's going to be sarcoid. Also in the differential, lymphangitic spread of tumor, silicosis, and co-workers pneumoconiosis do it uh, relatively uncommon in clinical practice these days, and then rare amyloid and lymphoid interstitial pneumonia. Most of the time, this will be sarcoid. Now here is a very nice example of sarcoid with a perilymphatic distribution. Notice that we see nodules in relation to the peripheral pleural surface, nodules in relation to the fissure, also the pleural surface, and this a photograph of a lung, of a lung in a patient who has sarcoid, and we're looking down through the pleural surface, and we're seeing these clusters of granulomas immediately beneath the pleural surface. It's the photographic equivalent of what we see on the CT. Now, if you look at the same patient centrally, you see nodules in relation to the central bronchi and vessels. These are peribronchovascular, the second location in which nodules are typical with sarcoid. And here a lung slice, and you can see the nodules of sarcoid surrounding this bronchus in this location. So this is also typical of a perilymphatic pattern and typical of sarcoid. Now, with sarcoid results in the presence of mediastinal nodes in up to 90% of cases, hilar nodes are also typical. The nodes are symmetrical, very characteristic of sarcoid is symmetrical adenopathy. And if you look at a chest film, it's described as showing a 1, 2, 3 pattern, and I'll show you what that looks like. Lung disease is seen on chest films in about half, but much more frequently on high-res CT. Perilymphatic nodules with a subpleural and peribronchovascular predominance are typical, and there is an upper lobe predominance in sarcoid. When the nodules are, uh, conglomerate together in a patient with bad disease, you see the upper lobe masses, and these masses are often associated with satellite nodules or little nodules adjacent to the edges of the big mass. That has been termed the galaxy sign, but simply knowing that as satellite nodules is all you need. And late, you see upper lobe fibrosis, Fibrotic masses, you get fibrosis, of course, where you see the acute disease, traction bronchiectasis, cysts, and emphysema. Now, this is a patient with sarcoid and typical lymph node enlargement. The 1, 2, 3 pattern refers to right paratracheal, right hilar, left hilar. If you also see lymph nodes in the aortical pulmonary window, you can call that a 1, 2, 3, 4 pattern, but generally sarcoid is considered to show one, two, three disease. Now here, the plain film in a patient with sarcoid, we see some hilar prominence, which may certainly be lymph node enlargement. Notice that the nodules that we see are upper lobe predominant, and the hyla are somewhat retracted superiorly because of associated fibrosis. Now here is the CT scan in this patient. What we see are subpleural and peribronchovascular nodules, and where the nodules are very numerous, they conglomerate into these peribronchovascular masses, and you see small nodules adjacent to the large masses, and that is called satellite nodules, and this whole picture of this central thing with little things around it has been called the galaxy sign. Notice the upper lobe predominance. Now, in an end stage, we get fibrosis in exactly these same regions. We see it subpleural and peribronchovascular, and you tend to see these fibrotic masses associated with traction bronchiectasis. The bronchi within the masses will be dilated because of fibrosis. The masses are often central in location and, of course, with an upper lobe 
predominance. Another example of sarcoid with fibrosis, notice upward retraction of the hyla and reticular opacities and some cystic opacities in the lung apices, a reasonably typical appearance. The high-res CT scan in this patient shows fibrotic masses involving the peribronchovascular regions with traction bronchiectasis. There's emphysema in the peripheral lung because of fibrosis with uh, traction on the alveoli in that region. And in this patient, there's an aspergilloma in one of these upper lobe cystic areas. Aspergilloma is very, very common in patients with end-stage sarcoid. Now, a disease that may look just like it is silicosis. A perilymphatic distribution is seen in silicosis, and you will see nodules in relation to the pleural surfaces, as we see here, and then peribronchovascular nodules. Of course, the history is what is diagnostic in a patient who has silicosis. And silicosis in an end stage can look just like sarcoid in the end stage, where you see these upper lobe fibrotic masses. This is so-called complicated silicosis with progressive massive fibrosis. And if you look at CT in a patient with that, you see the same sort of appearance of these fibrotic masses in the central upper lobes. You can see satellite nodules in association with those, or the galaxy sign traction bronchiectasis, but this progressive massive fibrosis or complicated silicosis and calcification within the masses is quite common. Now you see lymph node enlargement in patients who have silicosis as well, and a characteristic finding is eggshell calcification where there is rim-like calcification of the lymph nodes, differential diagnosis of eggshell calcification, also sarcoid, also TB, and some other granulomatous diseases. Now the second pattern of lung nodules is a so-called random pattern, and a random pattern means that nodules are occurring randomly relative to lung, stru lung structures. They occur anywhere and everywhere they want to. Subpleural nodules are present with this pattern, but there is no predominance in the subpleural regions like you see with a perilymphatic pattern. The overall appearance is a diffuse and uniform distribution. Now the differential diagnosis of a random pattern is basically hematogenous disease, miliary TB, miliary fungal infections, hematogenous METs, and very occasionally sarcoid will have a diffuse random sort of distribution, but I only see one case of that every three years or four years, not very common in clinical practice. Well, here's a nice example of a random pattern on high-res CT. We see a diffuse uniform distribution of nodules Notice that you can identify nodules at the pleural surface, so you see pleural nodules with this pattern, but overall appearance is diffuse and uniform. Miliary TB, this a lung slice in a patient who has miliary TB, and you can see these little white dots, and they are uniformly distributed throughout the lung parenchyma, typical of a random pattern. Here the same appearance on a chest radiograph. You see these little teeny discrete dots, and they seem to involve the lung in a diffuse and uniform pattern. Now here the same uh, pattern of random nodules in a patient who has miliary coxy and AIDS, but we see little teeny dots all throughout the lung with a diffuse and uniform distribution and involvement of the pleural surface. And then here a patient with a lung carcinoma that has metastasized hematogenously, and what we see is a diffuse and uniform distribution of these small nodules due to hematogenous spread. Notice involvement here of the pleural surfaces as is typical of a random pattern. Now the third pattern is termed centrolobular, and a centrolobular pattern means that the nodules are occurring in relation to the centrolobular bronchial or artery. Now because of the, the centers of pulmonary lobules are about five millimeters or 10 millimeters from the pleural surface in the most peripheral location, in the most peripheral in the periphery of the lung, the, the uh, most peripheral nodules you see are five to 10 millimeters from the pleural surface, and the pleura is spared. You do not see nodules arising from the pleural surface. Because lobules are all about the same size, a central lobular pattern will often appear similar to a random pattern in that the nodules appear to be evenly spaced. But there is no involvement of the pleural surfaces, and that is key. And in different diseases, this pattern may be diffuse or patchy. Now, if you're trying to distinguish these three patterns, this simple algorithm is very accurate in doing it. If you see multiple nodules, no pleural nodules are present, it's a central lobular pattern. Differential will be basically diseases involving small airways or small vessels.
If you do see subpleural nodules in a patient with multiple nodular disease and the distribution is diffuse and uniform, it's a random pattern, hematogenous disease. If you see subpleural nodules and the distribution is patchy or non-uniform, it is a perilymphatic distribution and then the differential I mentioned with sarcoid being at the top of the list. Now this is a patient with hypersensitivity pneumonitis and what we see are diffuse nodules and they seem to be evenly uh, spaced. But notice that these nodules are sparing the pleural surfaces. These nodules are centered in their most peripheral location about five millimeters from the pleural surface. They're not sparing or they're not involving the pleura. They're staying away from the fissures. They're staying away from the peripheral portion of the lung, typical of a central lobular pattern. And these nodules are of ground glass opacity because that is what hypersensitivity pneumonitis generally does. This is the histology associated with it. This is a central lobular bronchiole. And adjacent to that central lobular bronchiole are these ill-defined granulomas that are typical of this disease. And these result in the central lobular nodules that you see. So differential diagnosis of this pattern. Typically, it's going to be a bronchiolitis. This is most common, and it may be infectious or inflammatory. Endobronchial spread of tuberculosis or MAC can do it. Bronchopneumonia of any cause, these, of course, being infectious causes. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis, a common cause and uh, resulting in inflammation. Endobronchial spread of tumor, again, bronchiolar alveolar cell carcinoma can do it. It's an important one to keep in mind. And then less common, a pneumoconiosis such as silicosis. And then a vascular disease such as edema, hemorrhage, or vasculitis, these relatively uncommon. Most cases you see of central lobular nodules are a bronchiolitis. Here a patient with shortness of breath and fever. You can see these patchy areas of central lobular nodules in the lower lobes. Notice the most peripheral nodules, about five millimeters from the pleural surface. Shortness of breath and fever with this appearance, bronchopneumonia. 27-year-old with cough, shortness of breath, and fever, some cavitary lesions that we're seeing, central lobular nodules with the most peripheral, about five millimeters from the pleural surface, tuberculosis with endobronchial spread. And here a nice example of bronchiola alveolar carcinoma with some patchy ground glass opacity, a large nodule, and then these nice central lobular nodules also seen due to endobronchial spread of this tumor. Now there's a variation on a central lobular distribution, another finding that can be seen that's very specific and you should know about. This is tree and bud. This represents dilatation and impaction of central lobular airways. It resembles a budding tree. If it did not resemble a budding tree, it would be a really dumb name, but it does resemble a budding tree. And because central lobular bronchioles are about five millimeters from the pleural surface, these uh, abnormalities will be centered five millimeters from the pleural surface, just like central lobular nodules. Tree and bud appears much more conspicuous than normal branching vessels in the lung periphery, and these uh, are often associated with central lobular nodules as well. Now here a nice example of tree and bud, a dilated impacted central lobular bronchiole. You can imagine a pulmonary lobule in this location and this being the central lobular bronchiole that is filled up with something and larger than it should be. It certainly looks like a budding tree. Sometimes you see a little cluster or rosette of nodules, uh, the buds being seen better than the branching tree, I suppose, the same sort of abnormality. Here another very nice example of tree and bud in the lung periphery. And a few years back we did a study and we accumulated cases with tree and bud. They all had infection. This finding much less common in non-infectious airways disease. So if you see tree and bud, basically, you should think that you are looking at some sort of infection. Here a patient with AIDS-related airways disease and bronchiectasis in the anterior lung. Notice very nice examples of tree and bud in the right lower lobe. If you see that appearance, think of infection, and this, of course, is an infectious disease in AIDS. This a lung slice in a patient with a similar abnormality, but notice these branching dilated airways in the lung periphery due to impaction with infected material. Differential diagnosis of this appearance, endobronchial spread of TB or MAC, infection. Bronchopneumonia, infection. Bronchiectasis or bronchitis, infection. Cystic fibrosis, infection. 
occasionally with aspiration. I've seen one case where a patient aspirated and it resulted in tree and bud. Very occasionally you can see this due to mucus accumulation in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis or asthma. And it's been reported in BAC, bronchial alveolar carcinoma, but I have never seen one. When I see tree and bud, think of infection. So here we go, a prone scan. Notice lots of nice examples of these branching opacities within the lung bases. Think of infection, pseudomonas bronchopneumonia. When this appearance is seen on CT, you do not need to do a lung biopsy. You have the patient spit in a cup. Look in the cup, and that's the diagnosis. Emphysema. There are three types of emphysema you can recognize on CT, central lobular, pan lobular, and paraseptal. These have distinct appearances. Central lobular emphysema is shown nicely. In this case, what you typically see are these focal lucencies involving the upper lobe. These do not usually have recognizable walls. The most typical appearance is this spotty distribution of areas of blackness without visible walls in the upper lobe. Typical central lobular emphysema. If you look at a chest film in a patient with central lobular emphysema, and this is sort of bad central lobular emphysema, what you see is extra lucency in the lung apices because this is upper lobe predominance. And this abnormality or this disease is almost universally associated with cigarette smoking. Now this is panlobular emphysema on high res CT, and this patient has panlobular emphysema involving the right lung and the left lung has been transplanted. So we're comparing a normal left lung to an abnormal right lung. Panlobular emphysema does not typically result in focal lucencies like you see with central lobular emphysema. What you see is a lung that is too big, too black, and has vessels that are too small. It, when it's in its early stages, it may be a very difficult diagnosis to make. Panlobular emphysema may be associated with cigarette smoking or things like alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Now the distribution of panlobular emphysema is somewhat different. Uh, it tends to be either diffuse or has a predominance at the lung bases. If you see a chest film like this where lungs are large and the lower lobes appear to be lucent and have small vessels, think of panlobular emphysema and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency would be the usual diagnosis. Paraseptal emphysema results in areas of lung destruction that are immediately beneath the pleural surface. Uh, you see a single layer of these areas of lucency, and it may be associated with central lobular emphysema, as we see in this patient. Uh, you may distinguish this from uh, honeycombing in that this involves upper lobes. You don't see fibrosis associated with it, and you see central lobular emphysema instead. I will finish with the discussion of lung cysts, and lung cysts basically represent localized air-filled lesions within the lung parenchyma which have a thin but visible wall and are well circumscribed. This is what a cyst is defined as. Differential diagnosis of lung cysts. Well, you see these in common diseases. Honeycombing basically results in a cystic pattern. Emphysema with bully. The bully are cysts by definition. And sometimes you see nematoceles associated with pneumonia, particularly in something like uh, pneumocystis. And occasionally in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, the patients may develop cysts. So these are relatively common disease in, diseases in which you may see cysts. But there are several diseases which are relatively uncommon or rare that are associated with lung cysts as the principal abnormality. And these are histiocytosis, Langerhans, lymphangiomyomatosis, and the lung disease associated with tuberous sclerosis, which is rare. And then Sjogren's syndrome or other collagen diseases with lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, which is rare. In these diseases, Diseases, the cysts are the predominant abnormality, and these common diseases at the top, you see other things as well. So here's a patient who shows patchy areas of ground glass opacity, a pneumothorax on the right, multiple lung cysts. This is pneumocystis with nematoceles. This is a common occurrence in patients who have pneumocystis. But this, on the other hand, is a patient with cystic lung disease as the principal manifestation of disease, a patient with histiocytosis. And this patient shows cysts that are very thick-walled and irregular in shape, which is characteristic of this. And there is a distinct upper lobe predominance in the size and number of cysts in patients who have histiocytosis. Characteristic findings, the cysts irregular in shape, thick or thin-walled in different stages of the disease. They go from thick to thin over time. 
There's a distinct upper lobe predominance with sparing of the costophrenic angles. Nodules are seen in association with cysts early in the course of disease, and this is a smoking-related disease. In adults who have histiocytosis, uh, virtually all are cigarette smokers. Another example of Langerhans cell histiocytosis, notice that we see sort of a reticular pattern, but despite that, lung volumes are normal or increased. If you see something that looks like fibrosis, but lung volumes are increased, think of a cystic disease. Notice that the upper lobes are loosened here, and that's because there is predominance of the cystic lesions in the upper lobes. And here are the CT scans in this patient. These cystic lesions with a predominance in size and number in the upper lobes, relative sparing of the lung bases. Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and this is this patient's lung removed at lung transplant. You can see a predominance of the cysts in the upper lobes, sparing of the costophrenic angles. Very typical. A 21-year-old smoker with cough, this person shows nodules with an upper lobe predominance and then either cavitary nodules or the beginning development of cystic lesions. This is what Langerhans cell histiocytosis looks like in an early stage, a combination of nodules and developing cysts. Now here, a 35-year-old woman, notice increased lung volumes, very large lung volumes in this young woman. CT scan shows numerous lung cysts. These are thin-walled and round in shape. Notice that these are just as numerous in the lung bases as in the upper lobes. This is lymphangiomyomatosis, and this is a very typical appearance. In this disease, the cysts are round in shape rather than irregular, usually thin-walled. They can be thick-walled in histiocytosis. Diffuse in distribution where histiocytosis has an upper lobe predominance. This occurs only in women of childbearing age. The occasional woman in menopause will present with it, but it develops during childbearing years. 1% of patients with tuberous sclerosis also show this abnormality. That's rarely in men. Now here's that same patient, the baseline high-res CT with the cysts and then progression over two years. Progression is typical. And this is her lung at resection for lung transplant. You can see that this disease involves the lung in a uniform fashion. And my last case is the last example of cystic disease I will show, a 72-year-old woman with Sjogren's syndrome who has developed lymphoid interstitial pneumonitis, or LIP. What we see are the same sort of cysts you see in LAM, but they are not as numerous. They are uniformly distributed. In this disease, cysts are typically round in shape, thin-walled, diffuse in distribution, but they are limited in number, usually limited to a few dozen. If I wanted to make the residents count these, and I've been thinking about doing this, they would be able to do it. They would be able to put a number on each one of the cysts because they are not as numerous as in the other cystic diseases.